Welcome to the Wiseman Method Podcast. I'm your co-host, Dwight Hurst. I'm going to be joined today by Claire Wiseman, as always, and we are lucky once again to have David Livingston with us. Claire and David are going to try to help me sort out answers about how the COVID-19 pandemic is affecting opioid dependence, alcoholism, or other addiction issues. I'll be honest with you, for me personally, it was a very healing conversation with all the anxieties that are out there around what's going on. I felt like talking to Claire and David actually helped me personally to feel a lot better about what was going on. So I think you're going to also find it to be healing and helpful. So why waste time? We'll bounce right into the call as David answered the phone and was ready to crisis counsel myself and Claire. David, Claire and I decided that you're just going to do therapy on both of us uh, for this call I'll with all you. of our issues yep. with oh the boy. virus. <laughs> uh, I think we're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, we're, we're talking, David. You know, it's um, we, we feel so weird of doing anything, being anywhere, breathing anything. It's just like uh, Dwight asked me, how are you doing? And I was telling him, I asked Jade this morning. Because I speak to her, you know, a million times a day. Not to ask, how are you doing, Mom, anymore? And I won't ask her because we really don't know what to respond. <laughs> yeah, it's all relative. Is it uh, compared to the before times, so to speak, before the last couple of weeks? Or, yeah, yeah, because it's, uh, I've been talking to a lot of people with uh, anxiety being activated. And it's like, yeah, we all have kind of a low-key panic attack all the time right now. Is I mean, it, it really is. There's a lot of things out there to be legitimately anxious about. And then just the, the, the way that some of our minds play with that too. I know for me, I get really worried. It's yep. true. It's true. I, I heard someone say on TV and I've stole it from them that, uh, you're, you're as healthy as you feel, not as healthy as you fear. Uh, and I try to remind people of that because I actually feel very healthy. Uh, yeah. you know, I feel good. Um, but right, it's a strange time and, and you look around and there's, you know, cause for anxiety and fear. So it's, it's a hard thing to sort of, uh, separate. Yeah, that's a good, I like that. I like that phrase too, of you're healthy as you feel, not as you fear. I like that. That's quite good. I'm going to steal that from, from you. You said you'd got it from somewhere else. So that's, I hope that's okay. <laughs> I think anything Please. that is helpful right now, right? <laughs> exactly. That's uh, one of the one of the things I know we wanted to talk about today as we're talking about it. I is about the effect that this is having upon people who are struggling with dependence or addiction issues. And it was funny, right? When we were planning on having this conversation, I think it was later that day. I have a, a friend of mine who works in the mental health field back east who he he tweeted something about it where somebody had tweeted out, why are the liquor stores open? And he tweeted back and said, do you want people going into like, you know, DTs or do you want people having, you know, health problems all of a sudden who, who might have a drinking problem and then we're going to have more people at the hospital. And I thought, you know, someone working in our field thinks that way, right? We, we think about, well, wow, what about this part of the population? How are they getting affected? I mean, because you got people on all sides of the spectrum, right, uh, who have started treatment and then their treatment's now interrupted, or people who are not in treatment and perhaps their functioning is interrupted with how they get by with their, yeah. with their habit. You know, Dwight, uh, I was actually responding to exactly the same comment on um, Twitter. Because I think it's not the right time to have decisions made based on panic. I think it's not the right time to make extreme decisions that might harm so many. Alcohol withdrawal is an extremely dangerous event that has to be, uh, you know, medically assisted. And we can't just suddenly throw all these people out there into a full withdrawal when hospitals don't even have the capabilities of taking the people with the issues they have right now. Right, it's not just the coronavirus, you yeah, know? Yeah, we start it, another uh, health crisis is, in the midst of our health crisis. Correct. So uh, obviously, you know, there there is things we can do to limit, you know, what people buy, how much they buy. 
But we can't just make extreme decisions that is going to put so many at risk at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, we, as uh, opioid medically assisted opioid treatment, have been asked by our hospital to limit uh, for the next two weeks admissions because uh, it is our hospital is a hospital where they are trying to keep atmosphere that is virus free. Um, they do own another three hospitals where they have patients with the corona. So they're trying to keep this hospital that we work from without any, you know, infected patients. They're saying, please, emergency cases only. Let's not wow. bring anybody that uh, is not an emergency health situation because obviously, especially younger people that can be, you know, asymptomatic can actually infect everybody in the hospital because we wouldn't know that they have it. Well, and that's a big thing just from a general sharing the, sharing the disease standpoint that people don't think about that of being asymptomatic. Yeah, it kind of so you're you're going through the same thing as a lot of clinics and hospitals which is everything that you can push down the road safely is, right? I mean, basically. Correct. So uh, we uh, did admit, uh, you know, two patients today were using heroin, so they are at risk. But for the next two weeks, we are going to push back. And if patients are taking other things, you know, that uh, are prescribed, we're asking them, you know, to hold on for a few more weeks, you know, because they are safe. We just... Uh, have to work everybody together, you know, to get through this without uh, any additional risk for, you know, the patients, our staff and everybody else. It's a very difficult place to be, you know. It's a difficult balance because I think in terms of uh, substance use, there's the chemical aspect, that medical aspect, then there's the emotional uh, well-being aspect, too, of saying, when is someone at that risk? And I guess that's a hard criteria. To strike. Correct. I mean, I wonder if that's a that that might be a good thing to for us to share a little with people is the idea of how do you know if you're in a crisis crisis, uh, you know, as far as oh, I'm in a situation in which I really need to be getting in right away because some people Correct. are going to try to avoid going going to get help. Oh, I, regardless at this point, if that's the case, I'll let them speak to Dr. Lowenstein that could medically evaluate them and talk to them about options. Worst case scenario, if it's an emergency crisis, then uh, the hospital would take them. But uh, that's where we are right now. What are, what are some of the risks that you think about people out in the community, people who ha- don't have access to treatment right now um, might be going through? You know, again, there's so much risk out there. I think if they are out there buying drugs in the street, obviously they are at risk. Um, they are more at risk than the you know normal risky life they have. That, yeah, I mean that's one of the things I've been thinking about is the drive. And you know, we talked a lot the last recording. We talked about the opiate withdrawal starting to be triggered and how people are chasing, not only chasing a high at some point, they're just trying to not go into withdrawal. And so that's a pretty strong drive to get out there on the street and, and try to find, which obviously there's just the, from a very basic level, the risk of uh, increased risk of exposure. If I'm out, particularly if I'm out in some of the areas you know, and, and consorting with people that I have to find and maybe do I even go to my regular dealer? Not that that's necessarily safe, but it's definitely safer than trying to find someone new in the midst of a crisis. You know, I have spoken to some patients that uh, at this point with everything that is going on makes you think maybe it's time. Maybe yeah, yeah. Maybe it's time to do something about it. I don't want to be a slave of this anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's it. I think that, uh, you know, from a psychological perspective, the what's happened is a, is a um, society is we've all panicked to some degree. So, you know, and if you think of panic as a 
moment of pausing, right, and and evaluating, right, which is really the the healthy function of a panic. It's to stop and to assess danger. You know, so that's what everybody's doing. That's why everyone's kind of reading their, you know, all, all the information that's coming out and watching television because there's an ongoing sort of sense of of an anxiety and and the healthy function of anxiety and panic is that it makes everybody pay attention. You know, that's also when actually people often get into treatment and and when people talk about hitting rock bottom, really what what they're talking about is a moment of psychological panic. So the the purpose of the panic is to say, "Oh, this isn't good. I really there is a danger and what do I need to do now?" And I think that's that that process itself is can be really healthy for people to move them towards something better. It's, it's complicated right now because of the medical system being, you know, because of the uh, COVID virus and all of that's going on with that and in terms of where to reach out and what to do. But I think at least to begin to understand that as a part of the process of moving forward. And if you are in real danger, um, you know, then, then do it sooner than later. Yeah, it is interesting how these things amplify uh, situations that are already ongoing, and a lot of times that can be the the outcome that can be healthy is saying, oh, well, let me learn from this for next time uh, to be a little more prepared or to be in a little bit better situation. Uh, I think so often we just go into survivor mode that w- maybe we don't stop to think about, okay, this this too will pass, and at that point I, I might find that there'll come something else down the road where I would like to be free. Uh, d- definitely, definitely. Um, right, because it's a balance between, you know, you, you don't, you don't want to do something that's dangerous. You don't want to become erratic in your behavior and, and you know, worsen anything, uh, but you do want to take notice of what it is that's, dangerous and you know so it's it's complicated i think right now because of le- you know limited options and reaching out at least for maybe the 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 moment but i think there still are options you know if, if you're ready to do something and get into treatment and so forth you can still reach out and contact people and set things up and usually when people usually as soon as there's something set out and there's a way forward people be immediately begin to feel better anyways. So so really laying the groundwork. It's interesting as you say that, this is a good time, particularly for those that might actually be quarantined or not able to work or whatever, to start looking at uh, how, how would I lay groundwork for that uh, in the future when I'm able to access treatment. That's a good, that's a good point. That's a good idea. Exactly, right? So, so let's say you're, you know, you're in a, uh, situation where whatever, you know, uh, um, if you're, if you're using, uh, opioids or in some way and you realize it's, you know, you're, you've got to make a change, you can reach out and begin to create a, you know, a dialogue and you can, you can certainly, uh, reach out to us and we can create a dialogue and begin to put a process together, you know, to move things in a different direction. So that, that's an idea. No one's exactly sure. Or, or I'm not exactly sure, you know, when that is, or I guess there's, there's factors, Claire maybe could speak to this better. Um, but, you know, because of some of the limitations medically right now uh, with hospitals. Yeah. Uh, you know, again, uh, Domus, you know, again, we are still open. We are trying to keep, you know, um, instead of six patients, that is um, a very small, amount of people in a 6,000 square foot house, we are actually keeping uh, three at the most to keep, to give patients that extra, you know, space. Domas, we're very lucky uh, because I had created an environment where privacy was, you know, uh, respected. So every room has their own veranda and it's a private room. Uh, and because the house is 6,000 square foot feet, uh, it allows patients to have enough space uh, between them and respecting, you know, even more than 10 feet of uh, distance. Dr. Lowenstein uh, still can uh, see them, uh, obviously, uh, through uh, the Internet. So there are 
things that we have been able to keep in order to help people. We're all going to have to do a lot, of, a lot of adapting our lives from here on. I don't think uh, for a long, long time we are going to be um, very relaxed, especially on, uh, you know, human uh, contact. Someone actually said, "Why this is, I guess, as good a time as any for this to happen. We, the benefits we have now is we can still have some medical appointments. We can have some online services. Uh, we can still watch Disney Plus. Uh, <laughs> so we have something to do even uh, during that time. But looking at that redefinition of human contact, I think that's also something that's going to be in the longer term. That It'll be very interesting to see how that shapes not only the treatment and sobriety path that people are going on, but also to see how that changes the expression of dependence also. And, and that the way that that's going to affect that of how that, that uh, is going to play out. I'm not even sure if we know very much about what all that's going to be. Obviously other than life itself, that's going to be our biggest loss in this virus throughout humanity is going to be the um, lack of human touch. It's going to be the uh, ease Mm -hmm. of, you know, hugging somebody, kissing somebody, holding somebody's hand. It's so incredibly important when we feel somebody's energy, you know, when we are at need. Mm -hmm. So I think not just in the addiction world, but as, as families, as parents, as, you know, siblings, Uh, My daughter said to me yesterday, you know, when this is all over, I just want to hug you and I don't want to let go. Yeah. So I think that will be because as much as we are going to do it, there's not going to be an ease about it. There is not going to be a total let go of your emotions. And that's what hugging somebody is all about is, you know, uh, becoming vulnerable, allowing somebody to hold you for that second. And I think um, that ease is going to be gone for at least for a while. I imagine, although I don't know what's exactly, I mean, hopefully there's going to be a vaccine or or remedies or things that are going to make this, you know, or maybe it'll go away. But I, I guess it's, we'll be living with this to some degree for a while while we have to take precautions because of how dangerous it is. But but you're right. It's but we also have to sort of live and carry on and assess other, you know, other needs as well. Um, and I guess it's you know ultimately these are personal decisions, um, but um, difficult ones. And um, you know, especially as time goes on, you know, and, and as, as you're both pointing out, where you know other needs become you know, have been put off for a long time, like, the, you know, the need for contact. And you think of the role that self-medication plays in some of the, the psychological loneliness and distance that already exists for many people uh, for various reasons, mental health and just uh, maybe upbringing and experience and different different reasons people feel disenfranchised anyway from that affection uh, than to say, well, that's amplified now by realistic concerns of exposure and and whatever long-term cultural you know things we have to recover from i hope to god that um if there is any cha- any changes in the amount of resources to the people in this country it will be directed to mental health the lack of mental health the lack of accessible and Effective mental health is the cause for homelessness, addiction, so many issues that has plagued the world, but especially this country. So I think if something good can come out of this, it would be changing how mental health is accessible to the public. Uh, We need to do something about it, and we need to do something about it now, especially after leaving so many people with the levels of depression, anxiety uh, that has been brought through this crisis. It is interesting to me. 
to see, yeah, to see how people pull together. And you see a lot of cool things people are doing to try to reach out. And, and it leaves me feeling like I'm glad we can pull together as a people. But just imagine if we could pull together when we're not under threat <laughs> of exposure to a pandemic, right? Uh, if we could just kind of keep that, keep that pulling the other mentality together all the time, uh, what, what kind of things we really could accomplish. I agree with you a thousand percent. One of the opportunities that it does present that I think applies to the dependence and addiction problem, but also applies just to everyone, is it's a good opportunity to look and say, now that we're more hyper aware of the loneliness and the isolation that people can feel, uh, who in our own family, who in our own system, uh, our friends, family, colleagues, even whatever, uh, who is it that we're noticing or thinking about uh, saying, boy, I should reach out to that person? Um, because it's harder. It'll be probably uh, in some ways we can avoid issues and avoid seeing each other, but it will probably be harder to hide struggles in a way um, as we're going through this kind of a thing, especially from those that are usually people we're intimate with. They'll, they'll be more likely to notice. And that is a good thing because maybe people can can notice when there's a need. I, I 100% agree. And I think recovery is also available. Available in uh, maybe a little different way than it was if you're willing to fight a, a better health. You know, this this is a great opportunity to start. How, how fast, uh, how intense, it's obviously different, but it, it's a great time to start. And that's a good thing to keep in mind. I know that in my office and other counselors that I know, and you've mentioned that for you guys as well, the phone lines are, are, are working to the extent that we can. And you had mentioned with the, Dr. Lowenstein still able to do medical evals to whatever extent he can to help people to figure out what the plan should be and, and what level of crisis they're at. So something that I think is a recurrent message in this podcast, don't go it alone. You don't have to. There are people who are there that are trained to help and people that do care uh, if if we just put ourselves out there to ask for help. Absolutely. As human beings, we are all hopefully stepping up to the plate, offering whatever we have, even at our own limited abilities, we are sharing what we have. Right. And this may be a time where our technology really, really can bridge a gap in a way that we haven't necessarily needed, especially in healthcare, where, where you know, people who need attention and need advice can reach out and, and you can get it, kind of making the effort to to figure that out. And it's usually not that difficult. You know, if if someone's in, in a place where they're concerned about something, reach out. And if Skype drops your call, don't be afraid to call again. <laughs> it's a yeah. metaphor. <laughs> our, our own recording today is a metaphor. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're going to leave it there and put out a plea to you once again to whatever your needs are, reach out to those around you. Take a good hard look for those around you who can help and also for those who might need your help. No matter how much you need, you have something to give and whatever you have to give, make sure to look around to see who needs it. As Claire mentioned, the Wiseman Method is open for answering questions and helping people to start the process there's some things we can do to maybe help out to set some of those plans. Look around for others in your area and community as well to be able to get some of that medical help. Don't let yourself just try to muscle through this period. Make sure you're taking care of yourself medically, emotionally, and psychologically. We're going to be with you through this crisis as well, which means we'll be back again with you soon talking about questions and answers around opioid dependence and the related issues that you find there. So remember, until then, keep asking questions because when you have questions, you have answers. And whenever you have answers, you do have hope. If you want to see more information about the Wiseman Method, go to www.opiates.com or follow us on Twitter at opiates. For Claire Wiseman and David Livingston, I've been Dwight Hurst. We'll see you again soon. This podcast is produced by Popped Collar Productions, a company helping you reach your goals through podcasting applications. To learn more, visit poppedcollar.net.